Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about integration testing in part 12 of Senior Developer in 24 Hours. My name is Andres, and again, welcome. All right, so what are the takeaways for this particular video? The idea is that the end of this video and, you know, bleeding a little bit into the next video, we're going to have a good understanding of the value of integration tests. We're also going to have a structured way of how we can design, how we can create those integration tests so that we have something effective for our uh, development side life cycle. We're also going to talk about some of the trade-offs that we're going to have to take into account when we're implementing this integration test. Um, as senior developers, you know, understanding those trade-offs and being smart about how we approach things is one of the key tasks, one of the key responsibilities that we have. All right, so, you know, let's start setting some baseline. What is integration testing, at least within this context? It's basically a methodology that tests the interfaces between two or more components. All right, um, so here, you know, we're talking about more than one component. So we are going to verify the assumptions that we have about the interfaces between those components. How do they communicate? Are they going to communicate, you know, properly? Have we designed, have we implemented those interfaces properly? Um, integration tests can also help us to ensure that we're meeting the requirements that have been established, especially, you know, when we have changing requirements that uh, we have to account for. Integration testing, you know, if done properly, is also going to give us a chance to verify the deployment, that the deployment mechanism that we have is reasonable and it works properly because integration testing is a lot closer to production. Um, we can also verify, you know, the connectivity between the components, making sure that we've taken into account things like firewall rules, uh, that we're using the right ports, that we're using the right protocols, all of those things. And lastly, uh, we're also going to verify some of the functionality of the system. Now, this doesn't replace unit tests. This actually complements unit tests, but, you know, part of it is verifying this kind of functionality. All right. So if you remember in the previous videos, we were talking about white box versus black box testing. Integration testing in particular is a black box test methodology where we look at the system as a whole and we use the external interfaces to be able to verify whatever we're trying to verify we are testing. We normally run integration tests after the unit tests pass. Um, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail, but you know, this is a second stage after we have cleared our unit, unit tests. And they don't go as deep in testing the business logic. You know, we are testing some of the business logic, um, but most of the very specific, very detailed checking of the business logic shouldn't be done in the integration testing. It should be done in the previous stage, which is unit tests. So in summary, integration tests are vital for us to verify that when we combine the different components, including, you know, things like third party services, third party components, everything works together. All right. So let's quickly compare integration tests with unit tests. Uh, normally unit tests are easier to write. Uh, they're cheaper to execute. They require a lot less resources. They're faster. Um, and because, you know, they're faster and they're cheaper, we can run them a lot more often. Uh, however, unit tests are less comprehensive in the sense that they cover a little bit less of the breadth of our component, because, you know, there's always things at the end, you know, the interfaces, things like that, that we might be bypassing. So integration testing is going to allow us to test things more end to end, but they are going to be a little bit less deep 
then we can potentially go with a unit test. Uh, now, there is a big caveat here. Um, unit tests are easier to write unless we're talking about a badly architected application. And we're going to talk a little bit about more detail in a future section, uh, because there are some cases where integration testing, for practical reasons, can be an easier alternative than doing unit tests, especially when we're talking about legacy applications, applications that might not have been architected in the best way, things like that. All right, let's talk about something else that is fairly popular nowadays, which is testing in production. Uh, testing in production, you know, it requires us to be able to deploy a new version to the, of the code into production. Um, it requires us to have monitoring functionality for us to uh, be able to monitor the different versions. We also need to have the right infrastructure to be able to split traffic between old versions and new versions. We also need to have uh, not only the infrastructure to deploy our code to production in a kind of like a canary release, but also to be able to roll back when the changes don't go as expected. And, you know, testing in production is great because it is going to help us bridge the gap between what is QA and, and production. Um, obviously, you know, no matter how much testing we do in our testing environments, it's not exactly the same thing as production. Um, but, you know, we're going to focus on integration testing. Future sessions, we're going to talk about, hey, how can we test in production? If we've released, if we have the maturity to be able to re release some code into production and just send tiny percentage of traffic directly to this new version, there's a lot of cool things we can do. But for now, let's focus on, you know, the previous steps where we still haven't released the production, where we don't have that operational maturity, where we don't have all of that infrastructure set up, and we need integration testing to be able to release with a lot more certainty, with a lot less risk. All right, uh, but this sounds really hard. And the truth is, it is really hard. So we have to start breaking down this problem where we have this very big system. We want to test this very big system. We need to break it down into more manageable pieces so that we can tackle this and get some meaningful tests that are going to give us good value without taking a significant amount of time. Because these things are, you know, they're hard to write, they're hard to maintain. All right, so the first thing is let's try to go a little bit deeper into the different ways in which we can do integration testing. And, you know, depending on who you listen to, we can split up integration testing into incremental integration testing, which is normally subdivided into three different uh, ways. One is top down. The other one is bottom up. The other one is hybrid. We're going to go into detail into what each one of those means. And also non-incremental integration. All right, so let's go into a little bit more detail about incremental integration strategy. And again, like we mentioned, we have uh, top down, we have bottom up, and we have hybrid. And the idea is that we're adding modules one by one based on need, based on when they become available, based on when we feel that they're ready to be integrated into the stack. So, you know, piecemeal, we're building up our testing um, stack. Okay, let's go with top-down first. And the idea with top-down incremental integration testing is that we're going to start testing higher-level components first. Um, we start, you know, testing the component that is closest to the user. And whatever test driver that we have is going to go into the system through that top-level component. Then, you know, again, we're doing this incrementally. As new components come online, 
we can go ahead and start adding those components into the stack and we can get a more comprehensive representation of what the system is going to look like in production. So fairly straightforward. What are the advantages of doing things from top down? First one is we can show a prototype earlier, you know, because we are trying to test things from the perspective of the user, whether it's a human user or an external system that is going to hit our system. Um, we're getting closer to being able to show a prototype earlier to be able to validate that our assumptions really match the expectations of the users or whomever is giving us requirements. Um, you know, we're closer to the perspective of the user. That is always a big advantage. You know, there's always also some disadvantages and we have to put those things in the balance. Um, lower components might be less well tested because, you know, they're further down the the stack. So we are focusing more at the top. We are having our driver hit things from the top down. So lower level components might not have as much as much attention, might not, might not have as much um, testing done on them. Uh, the other big, big disadvantage is that we might require mocking more components because you know we are building things from the top down so to be able to get the higher level components to work we might have to mock down some of the lower level components how would that look like uh, for example you know if we have component one that talks to component two if we don't have component two straight up we might have to mock it and then you know, when we have a real setup of component two, when we have a real component that we can put into our stack, we can replace the mock with the real component. All right, um, now let's talk about bottom up, which as you would imagine, we're testing the lower level components first. What we're doing here, we're building the foundation. We start testing the lowest level, you know, in this case, we would have to create a test that can exercise the components from the bottom up. And as we are adding more components, you know, we start creating interfaces or pointing our driver or tailoring our tests to be able to hit the higher level components as we start building upon our foundation. All right. So what are some of the advantages of testing things from the bottom up? Uh, one of the advantages is that it will make it easier for us to identify issues. Since we're building things from the bottom up, we're going to have a lot more tests. We're going to have a lot more interfaces for us, for us to, to be able to test each layer of the architecture as we're building it up. And because we have all of those tests, it makes it easier to isolate where a problem might be happening it might make it easier for us to write a particular test to demonstrate a particular uh, problem that we're having. So it does give us that particular advantage. It also verifies the soundness of the architecture because we're building things from the ground up. So, you know, we can see how things start to fall into place. Now let's talk about some of the trade-offs. It might require writing extra interfaces to drive the test. Again, you know, we're testing a different, um, a different layers starting at the bottom one. So we're going to have to figure out how to test each layer. The advantage is that because we're building this extra interfaces, because we're building all of these extra tests, those are things that we can keep maintaining moving forward and have, you know, more coverage, more granular testing. And that potentially can help us, you know, identify bugs and identify exactly which layer is causing some issue. Uh, the other thing is because we are building things from the ground up, it makes it a lot harder for us to show a prototype. It's going to be really hard for us to show a prototype where we're basically just testing 
a database layer. However, when we were talking about bottom up, we're again, we're trying to build things from the top down. So we have something that is a lot more closer to the user and we can show it a lot earlier in a meaningful fashion. All right. Uh, the other one is hybrid. You know, when we have a lot of components, when we have a lot of themes, we can start testing components as they become available. Um, so, you know, in a case like this, we would have our whole stack. Some of the components might be the real components. Some might have to be mocks, emulators, stops, things like that. And as we get the real components online, we can replace them for the mocks, for the stops that we have in our architecture. So, you know, this is probably the most agile way in which we can do things. Works great as long as we can coordinate with other teams. It can allow better testing at all of the, of the layers because uh, we are going to be looking at the system not from the top, not from the bottom, but we're going to be looking at it from each particular layer and see how each layer talks to the corresponding layers that it interacts with. Um, again, you know, some of the other disadvantages might require some extra interfaces for us to drive the, the test. It is harder to show a prototype if we do not have the, the layers at the top fully implemented. And again, it requires a lot more coordination. It requires a lot more careful, thoughtful approach to be able to piece together this puzzle. Because at the end of the day, you know, I see this as a puzzle. We're putting things together. We're making it so that it will fit properly and that it will all work together. All right, the final way in which we can do integration testing is non-incremental integration testing. And the idea is that we set up all of the components at once. And, you know, this is also known as big bang testing because we put everything together, we fire it up, and we hope that it works. All right. So, very convenient for small systems where we can piece everything together. It is simple and straightforward. We don't have to coordinate with teams. We don't have to think about mocks. We don't have to think about things like that. We can just put everything together. The problem is that it is obviously going to take us longer to be able to put everything together because by this point, you know, we basically need to have the solution mostly done for us to implement this. So there is a long delay before we can reap results if we use this particular um, methodology. Harder to show a prototype because, you know, we don't have anything to show until the very end. And the effects will be harder to pinpoint because, you know, we're putting everything together at once. And if something fails, it is going to be a little bit harder for us to understand where the problem might actually Okay, so we talked a lot about what are integration testing, the different types and everything. So how can we actually go about creating some integration tests that are going to be effective, that are going to be maintainable, and that are going to give us more value than the effort that we put in? Okay, so the first thing is we want to define the scope of the integration test. Um, once we have defined the scope of what we're going to be testing, we want to define, hey, what are we going to be trying to achieve? What are our objectives for this particular test, for this particular set of tests? We're going to identify the dependencies that our system has, you know, because we're integrating. This means that we're going to be integrating um, at least two systems. Maybe it is only systems that we've created, but most cases, we're also going to be integrating with third party systems. We're going to be integrating with external APIs, databases, custom services that other people have written. Uh, maybe we're integrating with clients that other people wrote, all kinds of things. So we need, we need to identify those dependencies 
so that we can properly account for them in our plan. We're going to design the test cases. We're going to develop the actual test scripts. We're going to implement any needed stops or mocks or things like that to be able to implement the dependencies that we have identified. We're going to set up the testing environment. We're going to yeah, obviously, you know, execute the test and evaluate the results. All right. So the first thing we want to figure out is what is the scope of our test? Um, you know, are we trying to do a full end to end test? And if yes, what does end to end mean? Um, does it include the client? Does it include a particular client or does it include a sample client that we create? Where are the boundaries of the system that we're going to be testing? Because in here, it is really important for us to define this system under test. Once we know what we're going to be testing, we also want to determine, you know, what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to verify? Again, you know, we might be validating against an external client. We might be using an external client, or maybe we're faking this external client. Maybe there is an external specification that we have to validate against. Sometimes when we're building things against a specification, we could have a test suite, um, basically a compliance test suite that we can run against our system to make sure that we are building something that adheres to this particular spec. Um, you know, also we want to verify that the interfaces are aligned, that, you know, we're using the right protocols, that the data formats that we use match, and, you know, that all of the expectations are properly accounted for. Once we have the, um, identified the dependencies, uh, sorry, once we have identified the goals, we need to identify the dependencies and the interfaces. What are the dependencies about uh, among components? What are the external dependencies that we rely on? Uh, what interface are we going to use to drive the test? Are we going to hit a REST API? Are we going to drive the test by inserting records in a database, by sending messages to some messaging queue? What interface are we going to go to use to go into the system, trigger the test, and then to verify the result? After this, we are going to design the test cases. You know, we always want to design the test cases with the end user in mind, keeping in mind the objectives that we set in the previous step, and always try to focus on the most critical journeys previous videos, we talked about identifying critical user journeys because writing integration tests, it can get really overwhelming. So we want to focus on the things that really matter. After this, you know, we are actually going to write the test scripts. Um, the first thing we have to figure out is what are we going to use to actually drive the test? And we can use some of the frameworks that we're familiar with, frameworks that we use for unit tests, for example, things like uh, JUnit, Jasmine, Cucumber. We can use those frameworks to execute this test. We're basically just going to be talking to external interfaces and the tests are going to be decoupled from the code because again, this is a black box type of test. So, you know, there's nothing preventing us from using JUnit to call a REST endpoint or using Jasmine to call this REST endpoint, um, to do some operation, verify the result. And there's something to be said about uh, having all of your tests using the same frameworks, the frameworks that the developers are familiar with. So, hey, maybe you want to go ahead with this. Um, sometimes, you know, maybe when we want to use something a little bit more specialized, so there's tools like Selenium and Appium that will help you run 
some very specific tests, for example, you know, testing APIs or simulating a browser and things like that, that are a lot harder to do with JUnit. Uh, so depending on your use case, you might want to go ahead with this special like that. Uh, with this specialized tools. All right, now let's talk a little bit about dependencies because this is where things get a lot more complicated. And you know, when we're figuring out how to build or stack that is going to run our integration test, the closer to production, the better, all the way through the stack in terms of the hardware, in terms of the networking, in terms of the third-party services, in, in terms of the off-the-shelf components that we're using, the closer to production, the better, always. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to figure out how we're going to fulfill the different dependencies that we, deli <coughs> that we rely on. So, for example, when we're talking about internal dependencies, basically um, services that we wrote, services that we control, if we have modules that are still not ready to be tested, that are still not ready to be inserted into this stack, uh, we can leverage stubs. And stubs can be implemented in code as part of the calling service, or they can also be implemented as standalone services. And I have a couple of demos for next week in which we're going to see how those things can be done. We're going to implement a stub using code that is part of the calling service. And also we're going to implement the standalone service to fulfill one of these dependencies. And obviously, as we are building things, as we're putting things back into, well, as we're putting things into our stack, we want to remove the stubs. We want to remove the simulators. We, you know, we want to keep moving forward until we get as close as we can to the real stack that is going to go into production. Uh, when we're dealing with external dependencies, again, the closer to production, the better. If possible, we want to use the same component that we're using in production. However, we want to make sure that we can get it into a known state. Uh, also be aware that if we're using shared components, uh, it will limit how many test we can run in parallel. If we have a single database, you know, we might not be able to run everything. Uh, we, we might not be run, able to run more than one test suite at a time. So all of those things we, we would have to take into account. And that is why, you know, sometimes we need an emulator or a stub. All right, so how do we know that we need to create a stub for an external component? Uh, for example, sometimes we just don't have access to the real component. There is no way they're going to give us access to be able to run against the, re the real database or the real API. So, you know, there's nothing we can do. Sometimes we can get access to it, but we cannot get it to behave in a predictable way because maybe it's used by a lot of different teams. The data is changing too quickly, um, all kinds of things. So if we don't have good control over this, if we cannot make this external component behaving a way in which we can, you know, create reproducible tests. Maybe that's a sign that we should create a stub or use an emulator or, you know, do something that we have full control over. Sometimes, you know, things are just too expensive to use. Maybe we do have access to uh, the API, but it is a third party API and they charge us, you know, by how many times we use this API. And it is just too expensive for us to use this for integration tests that might be run, getting run a lot. So, you know, sometimes we'll have to be pragmatic and replace this with something that we have a little bit more control and that might be cheaper. All right, so in the next video, we're going to look at two different examples of we, how we can implement stubs. We're going to finish talking about the steps that we laid up to be able to write effective integration tests. And we're going to talk about different aspects that we can be testing for in our integration test. You know, uh, once we have built up 
all of this infrastructure. There's a lot of we can test. We can reuse this and make it bigger, make it better, make it more useful for our development lifecycle. With that said, uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter or X, as it seems that it's known nowadays. You can follow me on Mast Mastodon or check out my webpage, javaprocess.com. Thank you and see you next week.